All right, welcome everyone. My name is Michelle Gralty and I'm the Awareness and Appreciation Coordinator for the DEP Coral Reef Conservation Program. So we'll wait one more minute here, let a few more folks join, and then we'll go ahead and get started with story time today, followed by our experiment. So I've got a few neat, neat skeletons I want to show you really quick but while we wait for others to join in. So first up, I've got a staghorn skeleton. This is a threatened coral species here in Florida. It's a branching coral species, as you can see, and the polyps, the individual polyps, are sticking out from the skeleton. Next up, we've got a brain coral here. Now, brain corals tend to grow in big mounds or boulders out on the reef, and they get their names because they quite literally look like the surface of a brain. And then the last skeleton I've got to show you today is from a star coral. Now, again, these are kind of encrusting or mound boulder type species out on the reefs. And we have tens of kinds of star corals out on the reef. And they get their name because if you look in the middle of each little polyp here, you can see it kind of makes a star pattern. So even though star corals come in different shapes and sizes, the insides of their polyps all look the same. Now, before we go ahead and get started with the story, I want to ask you all a question. So do you think that a coral is a plant, an animal, or a mineral? Go ahead and let me know what you think. All right. Good job. It looks like everyone said animal, and that is correct, which is pretty surprising because they look like rocks and sometimes they behave like plants, but really they are animals. Good job. All right. I've got, let's see, one more poll for you all. How familiar are you with coral bleaching? Maybe you've heard of it before, but you're unsure what it is. You're pretty confident. You feel like you could describe it to me or coral bleaching is something that's new to you. Great. Looks like we've got a handful of folks who could describe it to me. And for some of you, this is a new term, which is wonderful. So we'll go through this a bit later today. So without further ado, we are going to get into our story. So today I'll be reading to you Jump Into Science, Coral Reefs by Sylvia Earle. How would you like to visit the underwater world of the coral reef? In warm, clear oceans around the world, coral reefs circle our earth like a belt of beautiful jewels. Coral reefs are like rainbow colored cities. Even the buildings are alive. Day and night, many creatures are out swimming around. Others peek from cracks and holes. Humans can't breathe underwater like a fish can, but you can still visit coral reefs Strap on a face mask, snorkel, and flippers, and come along. Corals belong to a group of animals that have soft, jelly-like bodies. They all have slippery arms with tiny, stinging cells. Jellyfish, anemones, and sea fans are among their many relatives. The reef buildings are made from the skeletons of many tiny animals, called coral polyps. Each little coral animal looks like a flower growing from a stony pot. It is no wonder people once thought they were plants. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of small coral animals lock together in fantastic shapes. Some form branches like the horns of a deer, an elk, or moose. Some make huge mounds that look like giant brains. 
others grow in the shape of mushrooms. Coral reefs grow in shallow, clear, warm water. Once a year, a few days after the last full moon of summer, reef corals release their eggs into the sea. The eggs grow into little larvae, baby corals, that drift for several weeks. Young corals need a rocky bottom or other hard surface to grow on. Sometimes they settle on shipwrecks. They can grow into beautiful shapes that make the wrecks look like coral castles. For reef building corals to grow, the temperature has to be just right. Not too hot, not too cold. There must also be just the right amount of salt in the water. Not too much, not too little, and reef corals need sunlight to grow. Hundreds of tiny plants shaped like jelly beans live inside each soft coral animal. They make the corals colorful green, blue, gold, pink, or sometimes even pale purple. When everything is just right, reef building corals build hard skeletons around their soft bodies. The corals divide many times and lock together to form reefs. These are the buildings in the underwater city. So, who lives in this underwater city? Millions of creatures. Some are short, round, and hollow. Others are long and slim. A few look like stars or pin cushions. Many are very small. There are sponges, animals that have no arms, legs, or eyes. To eat, they pump water through dozens of tiny holes in their bodies and strain out small plants and animals. There are mollusks, animals with soft bodies and no backbone. Some, such as clams and snails, live in hard shells. Others, the octopuses and squids, can move fast by squirting water out of their bodies. It is a special kind of jet propulsion. There are also sea stars, sea cucumbers, serpent stars, and sand dollars, the spiny skinned animals. They move using their hundreds of feet with suckers on the end. Some reef animals are soft on the inside, but have their skeleton on the outside. Look at the crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. Each leg, each long antenna, even each eye is covered in a stiff outer shell. As they grow, they split out of their old shells. Then new shells form. It's like they're changing into larger clothes. Many types of worms live on the reef too, but they're not like the earthworms you know. Some are bright and fancy, such as Christmas tree worms. Others are very small and hide deep within the corals. And of course, there are fish. All fish have a backbone, beautiful eyes, a heart, and a brain. About one quarter of all of the kinds of fish known in the sea live around coral reefs. There are parrotfish as bright as tropical birds with a mouth that looks a lot like a parrot's beak. Bright yellow, silver, and black butterfly fish dance about, usually in pairs sometimes in groups called schools. There are angelfish as gentle as kittens, grouper as playful as puppies, damselfish that move like dancers, and hundreds of others. Many reef dwellers find food in nearby meadows of sea grasses. Some eat tiny creatures that float over the reef. And then there are big toothy barracuda, sleek sharks, large snappers, and moray eels. They are the predators. They eat fish or squid or other creatures who eat smaller fish, 
who eat seaweed or shrimp or other animals. It is all part of what makes the underwater city live and grow. Just as cities have tourists, reefs have special visitors. Sometimes sea turtles glide by or pause for an underwater nap. Hawksbill turtles come to munch on their favorite reef sponges. Green sea turtles come to snack on sea grasses. Big loggerhead turtles may stop to search for a jellyfish lunch. Like turtles, dolphins may visit and then slip away to the open sea. Some fish make their own beds at night. Parrotfish spin a special jelly-like sleeping bag around themselves. Certain triggerfish sleep on their sides, covering up with a light dusting of sand. Garden eels disappear into their burrows. But coral reefs, like other great cities, never sleep. At night, many creatures come out of hiding places. Bright red squirrel fish swim out of small caves. Basket starfish curled up by day spread their arms wide at night to feed. Swimming over a reef at night, you may find yourself covered with sparkling lights. Thousands of small swimming creatures light up the sea. Tiny shrimp produce brilliant puffs of light. Jellyfish glow. Some coral reefs are much larger than our biggest cities. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia stretches for 1,250 miles. Some reefs grow like lacy fringes along many miles of shore. Others, called atolls, grow in a ring around large lagoons. Reefs make up only a small part of the ocean but they are as important to the sea as rainforests are to the land. They protect the shore from storms. Some of the reef sponges, corals, and seaweeds are used to make medicines, but most important to us, coral reefs help keep the ocean healthy. For millions of years, long before people built cities, coral reefs have been living in the clear, warm waters of the world. But today, many reefs are sick, some are dying. To help protect coral reefs, people are trying to stop pollution from damaging them. Parks are being formed underwater. People are studying reefs to find out what other things can be done to save them. With knowing comes caring. With caring, people can help restore coral reefs to good health. That's good for the corals, good for the sponges, good for the fish, and good for the people too. Please come and visit a coral reef again soon. And thankfully here in Florida, we have our very own coral reef. Florida's coral reef starts all the way up at the St. Lucie Inlet in Martin County, and it stretches down past West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Key Largo, even past Key West to the dry Tortugas. So I'm going to go ahead and launch another poll here. How long do you think Florida's coral reef is? 105 miles long, 350 miles long, or 500 miles long. Good job. All right, looks like most of you got that right. Florida's coral reef is 350 miles long. That's great. That's like driving from Miami to Jacksonville. So if you've ever done that drive before, you know how long it is. All right, I've got two more questions for you all, and then we'll go into our little science experiment. Let me make sure the water's warmed up over here. All right. 
So first up, we've got where are you joining us from? Are you joining us from one of the counties that border the reef? Are you somewhere else in Florida, somewhere else in the US, or perhaps even outside of the United States? We've got a good mix of people. Wonderful. I'm in Miami, so I'm in Miami Dade County. All right. And now that we've got our water boiling, it's time for our last poll. Have you ever visited a coral reef? Any coral reef at all? Wonderful. Looks like we've got a great mix of people here too. Most of you have visited the reef, which is wonderful. So hopefully you can hear me over the boiling water, but we're going to launch our science experiment now, or rather demonstration. So what I've got here is a 3D printed model of a coral polyp. So you remember from our book that one of these corals is made up of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual coral polyps. So this is what it looks like from the outside. We've got our limestone or calcium carbonate skeleton here. That's the white part. And then the blue part represents the living tissue. So this is kind of like our upside down jellyfish. And here we've got the tentacles that have stinging cells, just like the jellyfish. And then when we look in, we can see that's the mouth of the coral polyp there. So when we open it and we get a sense of what's inside, we can see that the skeleton has a lot of holes, kind of like Swiss cheese. And that's why our limestone here in Florida looks like that too. And then we've got the living tissue here, and these are the coral inside. So that's its stomach, and we've got the mouth right there. So when coral bleach, the bright and colorful algae that live inside their tissue and give them their color leave. It's like the coral's way of telling us that it's sick. So many times when we hear of coral bleaching, often in the news, it's because the water is very hot, too hot for the coral. Just like we learned in the story, the coral doesn't want the water to be too hot or too cold. But coral bleaching can be caused by any stressful environment condition. So in 2010, for example, we had a cold water bleaching event in the Florida Keys. If the water is too polluted, that can cause coral bleaching too. So the coral loses its colorful zooxanthellae or algae friends, and then it's very hard for the coral to eat and catch food. You can imagine it's pretty hard to catch something if you're stuck in one place on a reef for your whole life. So they really rely on those algae to photosynthesize and give them nutrients. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna see what happens when we put this polyp model in hot water. So I've been boiling some water over here and I'm gonna pour it into this bowl. And so we're gonna watch what happens when I stick this polyp model into the bowl of hot water. Boop, we just dumped it. So, Sometimes people get confused because when they hear coral bleaching, they think, oh no, the coral died. Granted, this can happen if a coral stays bleached for too long. Think of it as if you don't go to the grocery store for a whole month, you're gonna run out of food. But if you go to the grocery store in a couple of days, you can get that food and then you'll be okay. So if the corals are without their algae friends for too long, then it's possible that they can die. But if the environmental conditions return to normal, maybe the water cools down, for example, then their algae friends will come back. So I just dumped this coral in the water for about a minute. And now we can see, oh my goodness, it's steaming. That's pretty funny. Now we can see that its tissues are starting to pale and turn white. And when we open it up, we can really see the color change there. So I'm gonna try dunking this one in a little bit longer. We'll see if we can get some more of the color to change there. Let's see if it worked. Oh yeah, it did work. So we got more of the backside now that has changed color. But if we let this model cool, 
if we let our environmental conditions return to normal, then the coral can regain its decent belly and it will be okay. So that's our fun little coral leaching demo for you all today. So that's all the content that I have for you all today. If you have any questions for me about corals or anything like that, feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat box. Oh, I'm glad you like the model. Yeah, it's really neat. Let me see. There is a website. So the um, file for the 3D printed model is hosted on NOAA's website. So let me see, let me move that chat box around. There we go. I should be able to pull up the link for you all. And then I can share it with you. They've got a neat video of it too. Okay, there we go. All right. Let's see, Michael's wondering if a coral bleaches once, will it be able to resist future bleaching? That's a really good question, Michael, and this is something that scientists are studying. So I talked about those algae that live inside the tissue, right? Like similar to how we have different kinds of coral, there are different kinds of algae that live inside the tissues too. And so studies have shown that certain algae species are more resistant to heat than other species. One of the clays, clay D, for example, tends to have way more hot water temperature tolerance than the other clays. And that's something scientists are experimenting with right now as well. Uh, you know, can corals continue to build up their resistance to coral bleaching? Okay, Elizabeth asked, is it illegal to pick coral in Florida? So it is illegal to harvest any living coral in U.S. waters. So be that Florida, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Hawaii, American Samoa. It's illegal to harvest living coral in U.S. waters. But if you find a washed up white coral skeleton on the beach, that's okay. Then it's considered like a shell. All right, we have any other questions? Those are some good ones. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today, everyone. And I hope you'll check out floridascoralreef.org in the meantime. And we've got one more webinar coming up in our Earth Month series. That's this Thursday. It'll be stony coral identification with me. So I'll teach you how to identify a lot of the different stony or reef building coral species that we have here in Florida. So thanks again for tuning in. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at coral at floridadep.gov.